I'm not interested in the architect as a source of information about the work of his or her architecture. I do think that's an incredibly important source of information, but I think the architect does a good job to describe that, and I think anyone that's interested in that can make that, find that information for themselves. So every architect today more or less describes what they were trying to do, makes that information available. I think the job of a theorist or a critic is to discover other content in the work. And I make that, I think many theorists and many critics have become lazy about that issue and have simply paraphrased what architects themselves say about their work. And so I go to a great deal of effort not to do that. On the other hand, I am interested in the relationship between architects and, the, and how they develop. And so, as I tried to say something in a slightly different form last year, this school is a particularly interesting school to me. It is one of the most productive, exciting, schools, not only because of how well it teaches and how extraordinary its students are, but how fantastically interesting its young faculty are and how well they've been developing. And for me, I've been at many schools, I've been very lucky this way, that have, uh, there are not that many in the world, but all the ones in the world that have shown that characteristic, I've been at. The Architectural Association, the, um, in its right at the end of its heyday, uh, Columbia, when the paper studio and the digital architecture happened at the end of uh, Cooper Union, and certainly now at SciArt. And it's been really something amazing to see. And so I wanted to investigate what the school environment has done um, in the development of the work of the faculty. Not in particular, and particularly not, what teaching has done, because that's, again, something you can easily find. For example, if you look at the education of an architect, you can see the growth of faculty in relationship to their teaching studios easily at Cooper Union. You can see that easily at Columbia. You can see that easily here. What you don't often see is what the relationship between a member of a faculty and another member of a faculty at an institution is, if that's even possible to see. Uh, Florencia Yapita came to SciArc at exactly the same time she started to practice on her own. So she started to teach and to work out her own architectural ideas at exactly the same time. And that must have been extraordinarily dif difficult. Uh, and the reason, and so, I, so just to point out, I mean, she had worked for Greg Lynch. She went to Columbia University. Um, she studied with uh, Lindy Roy. Um, and did, did some work with Sanford Quinter and David Roy. Those three kind of make sense together, although it's very hard to see the influence of that work on her at that time. I can imagine intellectually that form. She also worked with Alejandro Zaero, which she describes as like eating sand. I'm not so sure eating sand is so bad, but nevertheless, I guess if, you've, if you're not inclined to eat sand, it, it's terrible. Uh, if you know Alejandro, you know exactly what that means. It must have just been tortured. And she now is finally beginning to understand what music it might have been. She worked for Peter Eisenman for a year, which is a kind of rite of passage for everyone at the time. Um, then she came out and worked for Greg Lynn for five years. At the time she worked for Greg Lynn, she was working with, uh, at the same time at the office, with Ellen the Manfredini was there and Jackie, Jacqueline, Jackie, can I call you Jackie, is that okay? Jackie Han, Ha, Han? Ha, huh? sorry, Jackie, I just know Jackie, who is the head of the office. Um, and it was kind of an amazing office, you know, you walk in, I hate to say this, a bit like Charlie, Charlie's Angels, and we're gonna go into all those things, but at the time it was okay to say that. And it was very exciting for Greg, I know that, and he really, it was an incredibly productive time. And at that time they did this project, which I don't know if you know, it's called the Ark of the World. Um, Famous project, very influential project, also famous because Greg's wife called it the ugliest building ever designed uh, in an interview in the New York Times. It, it didn't do well for their marriage. Um, there is no doubt in my mind, and as we start to see this work, that this is the most influential project on Florencia's work. Um, other, it, she also, after she worked for Greg for five years, she came here, she started to teach. About a year after starting to teach, Greg called her back, asked her to come work for her and 
Frank, on this project, which was the Sentosa project, a gigantic year-long project to do a multi-billion dollar um, casino in um, Singapore, sorry. They lost the competition, another firm won it, the other firm lost the contract. Michael Graves built the building. If you look online, it's called Michael, Hotel Michael. <laughs> It's really one of the most horrible things you'll ever see, and it's the single largest money-making casino in the world at the moment. God bless Michael. Michael has a very interesting uh, business model, just in case you want to know. He breaks even on all the architecture he does, and yet in the contract he's required, he requires that all the decoration in the hotel is bought from him. So every painting, every piece of design, so zero profit on all the architecture, and then a fortune on horrible paintings that, he, that cost him maybe $20 to paint in his basement that he sells for, I don't know, millions of dollars. And they think it's fantastic. Like a free building, and then I have to buy these paintings. So anyway, so uh, this plan, uh, yeah, so you'll see these things show up. But this is, so 2006 she comes, or 2005 or six she comes to SciArc, and this is what she's facing. These are the works of Eleanor Manfredini, um, who's just built this Beijing pavilion, the um, pattern architecture, Marcello and Georgina had just now started to move out of their exhibition work and their first construction is the, that gallery. Um, forgot this guy's name. Anyway, he was, apparently he's dissecting things. What, what was this project? Is this, oh wait, I, don't, don't tell me, I know. This was the Paris Courthouse competition by Tom Wiscombe, I'm just teasing. And uh, Hernan's um, project for a, a house, I think, in Paris, is that right? All this is 2006. And Florencia gets here, and she's a fiercely independent woman. In fact, I was looking online, and we'll talk about this later, uh, of the, f of the f there's a lot of women at the school, and I want to talk about that later as well, but of the four couples that are married, she's the only one that insists on practicing separately and showing separately. Everyone else practices together comfortably. So she, it's her job, not only does she start a practice and have gone through all these incredible influences, to find a way to construct an architectural idea and identity for herself, and that's what we're going to be looking at today. And um, she starts with, a, it's not the first thing she does, but Eric gives her a gallery show. And I don't know, the other thing I think, uh, part of this conversation is going to be the competition, even the tension between her and Elena. Elena is not here, uh, not out of protest, <laughs> and not out of avoiding this conversation, but she's at my school at this moment lecturing. It was a piece of cunning planning on my part to invite her there at this moment. <laughs> They are dear friends, they work, they work incredibly well together. But there is no doubt, as we see this work, that even though it's very different, there are moments, the closeness of the work and the overlaps are conspicuous and that we have to pay attention to them. And so if, if there's a place of intense um, uh, confrontation, I'd say, I'd say it's between those two works and it's very constructive. But this is a, if, I don't know, it would be interesting for me if you see this. This st stands out to me as a unique, maybe not unique, but one of the few uh, installations in the gallery that's plan driven. And it shows something about Florencia's work that I think is probably not understood well. If you're, is that, that is, she is straightforwardly uh, an architect. She is going, wants to build. Her thinking is strictly architectural thinking. Much about her work would look, suggest otherwise. But this is about walking around in the space. And it's the most, let's say, straightforwardly extruded plan show that I've seen since that show. Um, and so you go in. So all the other ones are space filling sh projects or, or all sorts of other things. But this is in, in a very naive way, I think. And so the, all, lots of other issues are there about about color and fabrication and all the experimental issues that she likes to cover. But I do think it's very important that you see that not only is she work 
primarily towards architecture and all of the experiments she does, but she's a three she thinks three-dimensionally, even though there's much to suggest that that's not the case. And so the first, so I would say that if you go back and you look at the, how this work immediately situates itself in, in front of those four pictures, it obviously identifies its work. It would rather be re retrograde and uh, even more traditional as it starts off its project than the four other projects we just saw and find its own way from there than try to contest on, that, on those disciplines. Next thing you see is Alice. I think this is an extraordinary project. Uh, I know you've seen it a million times. Um, it's where she begins to look at, I think, cartoons and drawings and graphics. Um, to your eye, it, it may appear flat uh, or be about flatness or wall. The fact that, that it has those indentures, that it's uh, that thin, these things are absolutely essential to understanding the work and cause it to have an entirely different work psychologically, do an entirely different kind of work psychologically. If you look, if you are someone who reads the beginning of phenomenology and architecture, and you think about what Regal would talk about. Regal was talking about the way I, the eye work on near, when, when your eye hits a near surface or a middle-sized surface or a far surface. And then the issues of flatness began to be discussed in architectural theory about this time. And we, we started to wonder about the differences between screens and, uh, and, and Herzog and de Meuron began to do these concrete uh, impressions in which there was a 1 16th to 3 16th in, inch thickness to the photographic impressions, it fundamentally changed the way these issues work. Now, I don't know if she's thinking about this, but this is the kind of work I would be doing on this. But it stops these from being the kind of pictorializations in two dimension that later on we'll start to see in some of the her own work and start to dominate the flatness issue. But these are fairly direct translations of the Tenny Yelf card issues from the Alice. They're wall figures, they're quite unpleasant. They're not particularly light-hearted. They're material studies. Um, so primarily she's looking at, I don't know what the what, what it is, is this uh, what? Urethane. urethane, but is it vacuform urethane? Or? Uh, it's yeah, so I mean she's, a, most of these early studies are basically processed with, processed with fabrication studies in her mind, and that's how she presents them. But she's also looking at, uh, I would say, the, different, the distance between um, the, a, a light cartoon character quality uh, and maybe something like the grotesque that's still under the influence of her relationship to her husband. Or maybe not. This is not a particularly interesting project, I don't think. Uh, but I do think it's interesting because Eric, Eric Moss, who almost seemed like didn't even know she was around, gives her the first project, gives her, uh, recommends this to her as a commission. It's a wall, it's a decorative wall at a Presbyterian school or something like that. She seems uh, hell bent on making it the least interesting thing in her portfolio by choosing the ugliest colors. And you know, she just want, makes damn sure <laughs> she shows it. But, you know, it was not, you know, Eric gave her a, a gallery show, it took 10 years to give me a gallery show. Um, never asked her for a lecture. I think right now, I think the lecture series this year is basically he's gone around the school and figured out all the people he never asked for a lecture that he's embarrassed about and asked him for a lecture. Maybe I'm, I'm not sure, but, you know, but he did do this and she <laughs> managed to suck all the fun and all the life out of it, unlike any other project, and there it is. That is, at, without doubt, the ugliest green that you can possibly put on. So. Then she starts to, uh, I hope you can recognize that the arc and some of the stuff that we've been seeing on So she starts to explore, again, most of these cutlery experiments, table experiments, are to continue the formal language, to examine how some of the fabrication issues go on, to uh, continue to build her identity as her own identity in the context of this school, 
clearly, if we were to go back, we would also see the teaching informs it and her own investigation of relationships to other architects. So she's avoiding contact, I think, but um, can't avoid it too much. Um, so this is the cutlery. It starts to show some of the, uh, two t the surface coloration and tr uh, issues that are, I think Elena is at that time starting to work with also. Less, so I would say by now, the, the dialogue or the competition between the two of them is tacit but in evidence. And she's still trying to find a way to keep her work sufficiently three-dimensional, staying in and out of the two-dimensional argument, staying away from the flatness problem as best she can, and using the particular typologies that she's working with to exaggerate those issues. Uh, she starts then to look more closely and more carefully in the art world. I think Jeff Koons has a big influence on her. It's very interesting how Jeff Koons exercises an influence on both Elena and um, Florencia. Florencia is very attentive to the sculptures. Elena works primarily, I would say, with the paintings. Um, this sculpture in particular, because the, uh, all the other sculptures don't show a whole lot of penetration, this sculpture in particular, because the latter actually penetrates her figures, seems to exercise a lot of uh, power on her work. But also Murakami, the, Jap oh, maybe you don't see it. the Japanese artist Murakami, uh, and this particular, the, the paintings are well known, but this particular installation at the, um, in Rockefeller Center seems to start to affect her work and certainly affects her teaching. You start to see a, a lot of these kinds of figures uh, in the public sphere. And this is where I start to notice something that I thought Murakami's work has, that she shares her work in common. She will talk a lot about affect about wanting her work to have a kind of fantasy or emotional impact. But I always find her work, particularly her professional work, to have a great deal of uh, distance, to almost, be, to almost be indifferent, emotionally indifferent, which I think gives it an architectural quality. I think architecture cannot be too immersive, too intense. Its durations are too slow that it can become too theatrical. If you are, for example, too fascinated by a faca facade over a long period of time, it becomes a bad joke. And so there is a way that her work withholds itself to you. And I think she starts to, I think her native architectural training is more at, at work in her work than her expressed desires. And I, for example, this is not, it's more, if, if anything, it's slightly disturbing. And I think that's what you'll find in her work. Uh, the flower vases, you start to see a combination of the cartoon work, the sculptural work, the interest in Coons with the um, work on Sentosa plus the work on, on uh, plus the, uh, what do you call it, the ark. And then it becomes fully manifest in the playgrounds. And, you know, and now you're seeing the all, this is where I think she's now identified a mature style, it's hers, and no one else is doing it. It's where I become super interested in the figure personally, and where Andrew and I start to really respond to her work in a new way. This ends up in the show in a lot of ways, and Andrew starts to do it. And at this point, I think she's now a fully, in a precocious period of time, a fully manifest architectural intelligence in her own right as a member of the faculty in a way that could probably not have happened at any other school for reasons of the pressures of a, um, for lack of pressures of competition, but also with pressures of issues like the pressures of uh, having to teach a particular, what do you call those things when you, you're assigned a class? What do you mean? Curriculum. Yeah, yeah, we don't have one, so I don't know the name of them anymore. I, it is an incredible project, I think. Now, again, I'm, if you'll think about the plan of Sintosa, uh, it is one of the best examples of an accumulated intelligence that continues to put itself back to work over and over again. Every architect I know that does good work at all shows that. They don't try to do it. They don't remember to do it. It's the only way to work. Uh, there is not, 
I don't think, a high level of communication between her work and her teaching, although you can see it. Um, finally, this is the most explicit case where I think she owes a debt to Elena. Uh, this is the Chicago Art Institute, and so this direct two-dimensional painting, it's not ZBrush, I understand that, but the figures and, and which comes first doesn't really matter, but this is, in fact, a two-dimensional project. She will just, you know, she's mad, I can see it. She all of a sudden went out and got a sunburn in about 10 seconds. And, <laughs> but I will later on show a piece of, you know, they're, they're definitely in an interesting, this is a bit like, I remember uh, giving a lecture, you may have been there, I'm not sure. Um, I gave a lecture when Rem was in Columbia and I don't know what, why I was so stupid to do this. I just thought it would be fun. Rem happened to be at Columbia while, and Bernard was there. And the lecture was called How Rem and Bernard Rip Each Other Off. And it was just a series of projects, one after another. First Rem rips off Bernard, then Bernard rips off Rem, and then Rem rips off Bernard. And they were just both like, oh yeah, of course, of course. And you could just see how angry they both were because they both thought the only th person that was ripping off the, anyone was the other guy. I don't like the ripping off is just a stupid idea. It's impossible not to work at the same time in the same way and share interest in ideas and technologies and not do it unless you're just bad. If you're working on stuff and it's bad you, and no one's doing it, then you're original. I mean, you're not even original, you're unique. If anybody says your work is unique, remember that sentence. Original means you've originated influence. If you're unique, you suck. <laughs> okay, I just. Uh... Now, about 10 years ago, I introduced ribbon candy as a decorative idea and a source of inspiration architect. Mostly, when I introduce something important, all the architects feel like they have to go find it someplace else. So she went to the Warhol Museum, saw his collection of candy, saw these beautiful colors, and used them in this wonderful scheme. Really a mature house, I think, in the Bahamas, which now, I think, shows all of the issues that have been present in the work. Again, in, a, in, a, in its entirely, this might as well be a middle-aged project. Might as well be a project not by Greg, but someone with the same maturity and development as Greg. And I haven't shown the plans. And it's too bad because her plans are fantastic. And I don't, I don't want you to think that she's ever not always in touch with a wider discipline. This project, which is also one of my favorite, does anybody know the real source of that party? Anybody who reads in a larger disciplinary sense you should immediately recognize that party as having belonged to Cool House in some place. Because that is the party, which is, uh, this is for one of the, the port competitions. And I'm going to skip it. That party was the original party for the OMA Trade Bibliothèque Nationale party. All of those figures that end up on the inside as voids were first put on a plinth on the left, that was the first sketch, and if you go back, I couldn't find a picture of it this morning, but if, if you go back and you look at small, medium, large, and extra large, you'll find a picture of a little model and drawing exactly like that with these figures in it, those figures, very figures in it on the drawing, on the thing. And so I asked her this morning if she remembers that from small, medium, large, and extra large. I'm sure she wasn't thinking about it. But to, but to be aware of the discipline and to have it in your unconscious or semi-conscious is always to keep these issues mobilized. And so this is a fantastic project. So I'm gonna, I wanna get to the discussion quickly, but I just want you to see how incredibly fast she's, and in this context, matured. And uh, at this point, the surface and the, you know this, you know the table. Now, this looks like a two-dimensional project. Uh, and at this point, she's now formed a uh, partnership with uh, Jackie, who's now Jackie Bloom, living in the Bloom House by Greg. It is such a small, incestuous, pathetic little world we live in, isn't it? Um, and I'm not going to show much, because they're going to do a lecture together in a month. And, and their work, 
is a synth it, I, to be honest with you, I, I've heard that others that care find the work getting more uh, conservative. I think what's going on in the combination of the two work has taken off in such an interesting way as to been like a quantum leap of improvement. I mean, it has matured, it's taking on large scale projects in a way that Florencia herself didn't do, and I, you know, I'm not gonna foreground it, but what you're looking at is two dimensional slices of a three dimensional forms as architecture. Is that, is that right, pretty much? And so the obsession with the three dimensional issue is constantly there and maintains the integrity it has in the work. And I'll leave it to her to discuss this with you longer. Uh, these are just a glimpse of what you'll be seeing in the next lecture. There's a, basically where she was born and where she is today. So she's an eight-year-old adult prodigy. Uh, and now we're going to have a discussion. Thank you. That about this, this time at SIAR. And, and it's true, literally the first project uh, that I've done uh, on my own after coming out of grad. Actually, at that moment, it was like in and out uh, to do that Sentosa project, but it's, uh, it was a SIAR gallery. So um, it, it was a, and literally, Eric said, why don't you try it out? <laughs> some of the things that I was working on in a really small research project that I had done for uh, Stanford Humanities Lab at Stanford University about color. So that came out as a conversation with Eric about how interesting it was to work with a scientist and work and how can you implement color in the gallery. And, and so that came out as a show, as a SIAR show. And since then, it actually has been an ongoing conversation with Eric through the project. I mean, if I put in parallel his work and my work, you would say he's not, uh, what you say, a fan this kind of work, but he's been very supportive throughout the time. So the fir first slide in 2006, I started teaching seminar first, but actually teaching studio in 2005, so it was like fully immersed in SIAR, kind of building up um, curriculum through, through studio briefs and so on. And then the last one is this one, is the SIAR, the, the UMA table, that was a show in Chicago that um, as, as, as the conversation continued with Eric, he went to see the UMA in Chicago. Uh, he went to see the Art Institute in Chicago show. He went to see the UMA also. He was lecturing there. He ended up seeing all the shows. So, uh, and he said, why don't we also bring it to Sire at uh, one point? So it actually closes with Eric um, requesting the, the, the table kind of to travel and to be shown here at Sire. So, so I thought it was, it was, it was interesting to show that continued support and the fact, as, as you presented, that every project happened through uh, the work that, that I developed with students. I mean, you see the, the seminars and the studios always work as kind of research platform um, for the work. And then, again, um, Umasayar was the kind of the last uh, installation that took place on that scene. But on the other hand, at juries, he never budged from the idea that in, particularly as more and more figurality, cartoon-like figurality, I remember the market, remember the jury with the figures in the marketplace, it just wasn't architecture for him. It didn't meet anything like a minimal criteria. I mean, so he, he was utterly, generous and permissive in his, not just tolerance, but engagement of the research. But in return, he felt entitled to express in no uncertain terms and with some passion his doubts about the work. Don't you think? I agree with that. I would say that if the first one he agreed as a scientific investigation, he, I lost him in the first, second two as too much of an abstract inve investigation. But was some, what, did you ever he looked mount at the sign? And the, he saw a house and he was drawn back to it. <laughs> oh, is that but, right? Yeah, because he saw that there was a tectonic attribute and then he started working with color as a material. Uh, the middle projects with the table and Maribor are first investigations about um, ceramic tiles and looking at actual materials to 
to being able to deploy um, colors and textures at an architectural level. So the Maribor was, he was drawn back with the project that uh, we did with Shaki in 2012. And then the idea that, that somehow got him back to say, well, let's see, let's, now the table makes sense. <laughs> Anyway. But did you include the scientific issues in the show? I mean, I, don't, I never read the wall text or, I mean, did you? No. So no, the, by the time you did the show, pink was just pink. No, the, the wall text was actually, Marceline always goes back to that. I asked a friend of mine who's a writer, Bruna Mori, to write a, a fiction piece on the exhibition. So there was no, there, there was no description of the, uh, of actually the content or, uh, what is the argument for the show, but actually it was fully immersive in that sense. So it's a full fiction uh, writing that she did for the first two shows, also for the LAX Gallery, about uh, a story. And then one more question. Uh, does the sense of it as an extruded plan ring true to you or no? Yeah, yeah, I think extrusion, it's, it's, it's I actually didn't realize <laughs> till now for the first one. Because some of the later work, you say, was becoming a, a bit more conservative or more, um, it tries to move on to the, the um, to kind of much larger scale buildings and so on. So there's a lot more, the, the figure and the delineation becomes more emphasized with extrusion as a first step. But, uh, uh, but yeah, extrusion is kind of to emphasize the figure more. So it's a, it's a tool. It seems a tool, it's like the first step to augment a profile, but then how, how extrusion can move on. I think that's something we'll develop more in the lecture. Yeah, I mean, I, I remember, I found that exhibition extremely striking for several reasons. I, I was also a um, new faculty member here just teaching critical studies seminars at that time before I started teaching studios. Um, was at the exhibition, was really, found it extremely compelling that to my mind it was kind of the first instance where someone had really embraced uh, in terms, of, there was a lot of discussion going on about color, also over at UCLA with uh, Heather and Jason, Heather Roberts, Jason Payne, but the extremity of, of saying, okay, embracing the pink, which is, you know, conventionally sort of relegated to something outside of the the serious architectural pursuit to something more germane to an interior design sensibility, and actually, you know, taking that on as the uh, sort of fundamental material of the show, that it was really material pinkness becoming a kind of um, physical substance, and everything else was very ethereal, the, the uh, plastic, um, I don't know what you call the technique that you were using, but the kind of riveting and curving of the uh, plastic figures, which to me, definitely, an extrusion logic, taking a kind of caricature from the Carl Blossfeld, where Blossfeld uses the photograph to transform the plant into something where it looks like cast iron. So there's a real sort of deceptive slip in terms of how we're seeing that sort of real object, creating a kind of, uh, a paraphrase, as you might say, um, something you brought up today at the beginning of the talk. Um, and then Florencia taking that and turning that into plastic, highly artificial, almost ephemeral, just extrusion, splitting open the kind of Blossfeld figure and revealing this foamy interior. I mean, I thought that was really extremely compelling. And then coupled with the, uh, this, the text, Cardiogram, I think it was called, by Bruno Mori, which was neither really um, fiction writing, it was more like storytelling. Uh, that was impressive. I thought, you know, the, the, the sort of um, bold move to do that within the kind of well, can, uh, you know, can y'all remind context I mean, of the CIR. I should have looked this up because, well, Andy's Andy's uh, big black wood thing. What year was that? Was when did the gallery start? Two thousand. The cipher. So, so, what were some of the hallmark shows between the? I mean. There, were they all black and white, <laughs> or dark, or or material, architectural material kinds of things? I mean, yeah, glass, concrete. Is that right? Um, yeah. Um, Stentorium was the the Koa show. Was that? Well, there was a vacuum form. The ceiling, uh, Darren, I think, made a, an 
And, um, Mi microphone. They, they, um, so really, so that was the first. And then right did a grass, so they were, yeah, they were like a whole range. I mean, I remember Joe Rosa presenting the pink. He was driven to present your work as feminist work, not as a woman's work or, you know, um, it's fine. But he presented the pink as a statement, a feminist statement. You were aggressively asserting your. Do you remember this at Michigan? Um, it was awkward, I thought, <laughs> <laughs> because you know it, that would have placed you in the context of Mary McLeod and Diane Gerardo and the sort of and Jennifer Bloomer and the correct the people, the first generation of women feminists that were quite aggressive and correct to do so. I mean. I remember memorizing the list of the 10 most famous under unknown women architects, you know, Eileen Gray and you know, people that we now know, Natalie, you know, just, I better not screw them up right now, and Ting, Ting and you know, so that just so I could show up at my fr friends' parties. But, uh, you know, so that was over, well over, and but there was a sense, and I think there still is a sense that there is a different project that women would undertake, but I didn't realize that the color was a scientific had any legacy in science at all. And uh, but it never it didn't stay that way at all. And now it's not functioning that way at all. You think of it still in affective terms, or at least decorative terms, right? Um, well, the, it was actually the scientific method was for purple, which is a color that produces a blur. So if you immerse in purple, it starts to produce, to lose the figure. So, so the idea that you immerse, um, pink is, I think it's a kind of post-feminist. You know, at some point, no woman would have like used pink because it's too representative. Yeah, in fact, the, I forget like, what they're called, but the. Unless you're five. But so, yeah, it's more of a simplistic way, I think, of identifying, you know, pink and blue, male and female. Mm -hmm. But I think pink is something that didn't really make an appearance in sort of serious architectural discourse. I mean, I would never identify it as feminist, I, although I, th I think it's an easy slip to make, but uh, inappropriate, in a sense, provocative. Because of but I mean, you said no, color. For, I mean, you, for you, you said color, not pink. I mean, everyone seems to want to avoid this problem that it, or the question that it was pink. Well, then the red. I mean, the Alice that that orange takes it. Yeah, orange. I see it as that orange. was. You think <laughs> you think that's red? Yeah. What color do you think? That's <laughs> With little orange, orange. inserts. Yeah. No, it's it's not red. It's orange. Orange. Yeah, it's burnt orange. Is that orange? <laughs> Well, both of them are color are, are not mixed colors. They are default colors that you find in plastics. Yeah. Uh, the orange, that's a, like a jumpsuit or the cones on the street are the same orange. So color has not, in this case, have not gone through mixtures like a painterly. So they don't have any painterly effect. They right. have more like a, a, a purely industrial material effect, both of them. Both are, are, one is vinyl, the other one also is vinyl. I mean, that's where I think the distance comes from. I mean, they really do feel, I, don't, I, I didn't see the pink one, but I mean, I, all the work, I mean, that's not true anymore. You do mix colors now, right? I mean, in the, I mean, in the PS1 and there's a lot of surface treatment now. Now they, they because the color they, is not any, any more solid. I mean, even in, in artistic, it's solid colors. But colors now, since we can print images, uh, then you can it opens up the whole world of possibility for graphics. But do you think about the psychological effects of the work? I remember when uh, Sayer opened and, and Eric was lying down. He said he couldn't stay too long inside of that that space. The Sayer. The gallery show. It has, I, I think it goes back to some of your writings, and you know that that idea that it can uh, you can engage uh, kind of an, at, a, an, at an affective level uh, with the work, and that that started to produce a distance now through that embraced that a lot more the first project. Anyway, if you'll uh, buy, everybody wants to buy and read the new log. In my review of Bernard Schumi, you have to read all 2,800 words. The last paragraph introduces a new theory of the event 
in relationship to affect. Oh. So, I'm one last shot at getting it right. <laughs> injections of affect. Anyway, micro injections of micro affect with no emotion, which I think is what your work no. is. <laughs> um, you know, I started just to put this in context. I think you know, event theory. I have to, uh, and. I, I, ever since Bernard showed up in the 70s and I got interested in event theory, I started to realize I've been waiting for buildings to walk into and make me immediately break into slam dancing. You know, that, that somehow or another the building would make me spontaneously do something different. That it would encourage spontaneous events, which is just totally idiotic when you think about it. You know, so all those first theories of events didn't work, cross-programming, disprogramming, and all that sort of stuff. They were supposed to make, produce spontaneous events. We knew they didn't work, but we kept thinking as they, we improved the theory that that would be the result, spontaneous events. And what also clearly didn't work was that. Because every time you get a spontaneous event in a building, it would be like a knife fight or something like that. You know, spontaneous events in buildings are usually bad things. People shooting each other because of popcorn. Um, so then I started to realize that the affect theory and the event theory should come together. And so, but if it's too emotional or too, uh, the duration of it is too intense, it's also wrong. And so it has to have a lingering effect and therefore not be very you know, th th there has to be something wrong in the building that lingers longer and probably is going to act as a sense memory. That affect in architecture is not going to be about mood. And that's what I think goes on in your work. That's why I think the indifference issue is so important to me in your work, is that it lingers. It, it doesn't happen with the same kind of intensity or I intentional intensity as something like um, Hernan's work or a lot of the work that, that we see. It, it, it seeks a kind of expectation of immediacy, but doesn't produce it. And then you wonder if, it, it, if it's a, it's, but it lingers. And it lingers and it kind of passes into a kind of semi-conscious state, at which point its production of consequence is spontaneous but undirected. And that's what, so when we were talking earlier, does, this, does that make any sense to you at all? It's sort of like, it's in you, but you don't quite know it's in you, and what happens after that, it can't control. And so it's another model of affect. It's, it comes from uh, Deleuze's argument that Bacon's paintings produce affect without emotion. Now, I just think that's total nonsense. I think he's wrong about Bacon's paintings, but he's right about this possibility of an affect producing zero emotions. But it's kind of like an excitation that hangs around for a while, a long time actually, and something happens to give it direction, but it's totally uncontrolled. And that architecture does that, you know, that it, it's completely at a low excitation level. And what your work I find does is to seek the maximum level, maximum low level of excitation. So I was asking about, thinking about your character issues. Mm -hmm. Can you elaborate that? Does that make sense in terms of those? Yeah, I mean, the distancing, I guess, you know, something character came onto the table when um, I was asked by, by Ming Feng to write a piece on Florencia's work for the SciArc alumni magazine, um, which eventually was entitled originally, um, well, characterizing the character was the, the final title. I think it was Between the Lines. Reading Between the Lines was the actual title I had chosen. Um, and it was really starting to look at how maybe some of this work deals with um, alternate forms of legibility, because there was that whole time in the early 2000s where the big debate between affect, legibility, and then everybody always would say, well, what are we making legible anyway? What, you know, that, that kind of... Uh, very heated debate that was going on. And I think something that I also found really sort of provocative and in, in a good way irritating in the, in the sense of something that wouldn't 
let go of me, like you're describing, it lingered, was uh, the notion that some of these things, like the Alice piece, I really thought very much about Edward Shea's liquid words, and the paintings um, of text, and how, if you compare that with his other work, where the, the photographs of the kind of parking lot, I mean, almost everything he does, there'll be a word inside of that, the standard oil. The, yep. And so I remember having a debate at Columbia with Joan Ogman about this, that it, it's, she said it's not at all about words or text or semiotic. Um, and then I showed her the liquid words that she hadn't seen, and she was like, oh, I have to rethink this. But the, <laughs> the um, you know, Alice, to me, was really, a lot, the fact that it was on the wall, that they're propped up, that they have this kind of, what you might refer to as the fictional index, you've often called it that, the right. drippy, that the drip really ends and forms the kind of base, how it meets the floor of the gallery. The, an odd, again, I would completely agree that the 2D, they're, they're they really defy two dimensionality because they're all the drippy. I mean, and then I think of how Yves Lambois writes about the liquid words of Rocher. Then, you know, moving through, so already there's this notion of character, and again, taking that to its root, where somebody like Sylvia Lavin, writing on Catramer de Cassis, talks about literal character and figurative character, and his fascination with hieroglyphics as being something that is both. Um, ornamental, like they're actually on the surface of the building, but there's also a certain degree of legibility. They're referring to a reality outside of themselves. And so when the Cronopius, or Cronopios, I don't know if I pronounced it correctly, to me was also really fascinating that someone would give that title, you know, that sort of act of naming, a really um, kind of inscrutable title to someone who hasn't read Julio Cortazar's work. Um, which I thank you for introducing me to that work. It's amazing. I mean, still, Borges is my favorite. But uh, the fact that the piece would try to almost insinuate itself into this strange territory of a story or a series of stories, a series of vignettes. The work itself is a vignette in the sense of the... Uh, Which one is that? The, the Cronopios? The Chicago. The Chicago Art Institute. I didn't know that. You didn't tell me that had a name. Yeah. I thought that was something like a gang of friends or something. That's how it's represented in a simplistic way. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for taking me into your confidence and telling me it had a deeper meaning. Well, it was called Cronopio's Drawing Off Edge, I think, right? And, I, and that was fascinating. So is it, that's a magic that. realist? He's a magic realist author? Uh, uh, well, it's at the edge, but not necessarily. See, I'm so, so mean of you guys. He's an Argentinian writer. No he, kidding. He has famas, <laughs> esperanzas, That much I figured out. I was going to make a joke about her being <laughs> Italian, but. <laughs> the, 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 that text works with, Cronopis is one of the kind of abstract personalities, but it's like, they're kind of real characters. So that's why the gun came as a. As a and how does, it, a how does it relate to the piece? Well, uh, Chronopis is, 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 is there's short stories, uh, and the idea that um, you know, Cortázar, Cortázar describes multiple personalities, um, and, the, and there's, uh, he finds that Chronopis is the most abstract of all of them. Even they don't have faces. You know, every time that people try to create a cartoon or a drawing of, uh, of, of those, you'll find there's these kind of green creatures. Uh, but the other ones are clearly, they're like people that belong in the world. They're rich people, poor people, everyday people. So, but the Cronopius is not. So it's that idea that it's between abstraction, uh, you know, and really strong char character. I thought that's quite interesting. And so these things, they work in figuration, but they don't, they, they don't figure anything. They, they, they are not the figure of anything in particular. I mean, piece one, they start to appear, they have more familiarity, they go back to Kunz a little bit more, that you want to recognize the geometries. In, in, uh, in Chicago, the Cronopius is in between. They have strong character as personality, but they don't have a figure. They make it, that's not that vampire movie they made. What's that great Argentine vampire movie with Chrono something or not? Anyway, sorry. <laughs> it's true I quit reading. Um, are you plagued by the problem of abstraction versus representation? You are? Good Lord. 
<laughs> Are you guys? Does that still bother you guys? I mean, I would have thought it so worries Frank and Greg. It's so unimportant in the, in the painting world. Um, I thought you, that one of the things that was really interesting about you is you were totally liberate. It's so clearly, I hate to say this, bugs all the men. <laughs> one of the things I really liked about you until this very moment <laughs> no, but so you totally liberated Jesus from it. Six to go rid of, of abstraction. I know, but I knew. Yeah, but it's present, yes. And are you? Well, I guess the question would be what's being abstracted? What's the... I mean, there, one of the issues of this fiction versus, I mean, yeah. uh, real, reality versus realism mm -hmm. would obviate that problem entirely in architecture. I, I just don't, you know, I want particularly in the question of a contemporary tectonics. If you are obliged to a traditional tectonics of a limited tectonics of the two kind of stereotomic and tectonic construction, <laughs> then you are going to produce an abstract, a difference between abstraction and figuration that maps onto ornamentation and structure. And so that legacy belongs to a history of how to build. But since frame structure, probably, but certainly now, certainly in the by the mid 20th century, that's not true. And certainly, how we build now, I don't see how it. It's a legacy. It's a a legacy of metaf metaphysical legacy, a disciplinary legacy. It's a bit like air conditioning or something. It's it, we're it's clinging to an aspect. Of, of the discipline that doesn't have any basis in how we work. But I, I you remember, um, I studied under um, certain um, theories, and that, that would be the idea that to bring, you know, moving away from postmodernism and looking into abstraction through fields, flocks, uh, that's the, you know, so the abstraction of typology, of form, of history, of everything. That's the abstraction for me that is latent. Yeah, and how I to know. advance that? That I, I know. But for God's sake, that was. You invented uh, it. Right? I know, but that was like so, a long time ago. Well, but that's that's a, a you know like it will happen to all of the students. You know, there's certain uh, foundation that you somehow uh, develop through studies, undergrad studies, graduate studies, and then as you move on, you know, that create a really strong. I mean, you said the plan. It's something, those things are unavoidable, you know, like how the, the drawing, and so for me, abstraction was so relevant for so many years in terms of escaping uh, traditions. So you, so you don't feel any affinity, you feel, you probably are not particularly enthusiastic about Fat's work. <clears throat> I find it interesting. I, I, I and, and I, you know, with Shaki, we talk a lot about this. You know, like there's, it seems to be a visual affinity. There's no, no question. conceptual ability. Uh, uh, there's no conceptual uh, <laughs> ability. Sorry. On their there's part. There's no conceptual <laughs> connect. No, because it's. Uh, there I is mean, a visual. There are connections between your recent work and. It's, it's, it's that escape from that early abstraction of the '90s of trying to define, bring back type. Why not? I mean, why not? You can see the figure of the house. Why not? Can you see the figure of an arch? What, you know, why not working instead of working with absolutely abstract geometries, uh, really bringing back a, a typological figuration in a way? That's the blame of Alejandro Sairapolo, I would say, coming back. But it's like looking at typological figuration as one way of avoiding absolute abstraction in, within the architecture. In the case of Fad, it goes back to Venturi in a very literal way, and it's a Highly two-dimensional. Yeah, I do it's think. Applied onto a decorated shed. I, I, one thing is really important is learning to say why not, which is how to get over received phobias and uh, pre proscriptions, but it doesn't answer the question why. You know, I do think you have to have a go not a reason. You don't need a justification, but you need a goal. You need. I repeat that in thesis all the time now. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. Thank okay. You to me. So, but it's important, to, you know. Like I don't, I hear, I don't want to do symmetry, or I don't want to do figuration, or I, you know, I hear, I don't want to do, I don't want to use IFAS. I hear all sorts of. Uh, I'll get punished by God if I use. Wait, you, you it took know. a while for collage to come back. Yeah, we, we, oh, that was. Yeah. You put the prohibition on that one. In that was my last one. Yeah. <laughs> But, what, but the abstraction versus the caricature <laughs> issue, I get, because I don't know if, you know, even Fats work, I'm not sure I'd call that abstraction. The house figure, you know, the, the caricature is something that really exaggerates particular features and erases others, um, is I think a little bit different than, you know, non-objective work or something that would move toward uh, loosening the referent. Um, you know, the thing about collage is something I'm going to defend. I think it's legitimate <laughs> to say I don't want to continue to do something that's lost its ability to work. You know, and that's I think that's our job. I I, I don't think uh, um, breaking cliches is a good model, but finding once powerful techniques that are no longer effective is very important. And to also remember that they'll come back to be effective again is also an important thing to remember. And, you know, we now have so much technology and technique now that it's important to go back and look at collage, and there's no way we'll go back and repeat that. You know? Although I cannot say that I've still seen breakthrough, I see newly effective collages. Mm -hmm. And I'm really glad people are exploring it, but I haven't seen the breakthrough I know is going to be there. So. Uh, questions from the audience? I, you know, I'm sitting here, I have to tell you, I knew this was going to be exciting. I didn't know it was going to be so heartbreaking and disappointing. <laughs> <laughs> Why is it heartbreaking? No, it's easy. Uh, well, I'm, the abstraction and figure I, I, I'm always happy to go back and think about things, but dialectic legacy, I mean, I'm always surprised. For example, Eric, uh, we'll talk about this. I hope people will come, if you can, come Monday when Eric and I talk. Because this conversation and the conversations we're going to have, I think my next conversation is with Tom. They're going to be in a book. And then the four conversations I'm having with Eric are in a book. And you know, we had one last time on, on construction. It was really wonderful. And of course, now I've thought about all the things I should have said, which is what, that's why we get that in a book. But the one we're going to have next is on a personal philosophy, which is a whole lot different than why you should read philosophy. And so I've been thinking a whole lot about what's the difference between a personal philosophy and a philosophy. And Eric certainly has a personal philosophy, which he thinks is also the philosophy of architecture. But you know, he's also he's very honest about how it came together. And you know, he always wants to stick that crowd slide up you know, about his experience of being in a crowd, a crowd of liberals that he was sympathetic with, liberal protest, but recognizing that the fact that there was a crowd, it was shutting down a conversation. And I'm thinking, when you read philosophy, you're going to read about the dialectic between the one and the many, or the individual and the collective. And when he sticks that s slide up, you realize that there's a whole lot of places on that spectrum. You know, there's the one, there's the partner, there's the partnership, there's the menage a trois, there's a whole lot of places on a spectrum. They're all discrete, it's not a continuous spectrum, they all have very precise transitional conditions, they all speak to various politics and theories and existential conditions, and we just need to get in the habit of spectral thinking. You know, so I'm happy to think that there's such a thing as abstraction and figuration. But I'm not happy to, to, to think that there's an oppositional dialectic anymore and that anyone is still worried about that. I'm certainly happy that people understand that there's a spectrum and that we now, we now know near figure. I mean, there's been some effort to introduce a whole lot of places on that spectrum and think through those. But to retain any allegiance to that is disappointing. And I, and I know you don't, and I mean, I'm just taking advantage of that. But, and I think those kinds of issues will come up when you think about a personal philosophy and how you form it. And I think that's why your work is so important. I mean, that's why I don't have any, I don't see any 
I do think it's important, for example, that the PS1 project is less, is in a different place on that spectrum, spectrum than the playground project. But it's not more mature because it's more abstract, abstract. You know, it belongs completely to me in the same body of work as Richter's abstract paintings belong with his figural paintings. I mean, Richter's paintings were the breakthrough, for example, in introducing spectral thought to a painterly, it's wrong to think of him as doing lots of different styles. It's right to think of those as all belonging to painting in a new way, I think. Anyway, questions? Joe, this is your last chance. When are you leaving? But I will. You know, actually, Jeff, I, and I learned last week the question should go to you more than Florencia, but I really enjoyed the talk Florencia had with Eric last year. It touched on some of the issues you brought up here. One of the things I really liked about it was that Florencia was game to talk about how her work operated with it, operated in terms of the discipline of fine art, perhaps rather than architecture, if, if, if that opposition really holds up as much as it used to. But I, looking at this kind of spectrum of, of Florencia's projects, it seems to me that a lot of the work is actually operating in interstices of fine art more than, more than and perhaps more provocatively than they, than they address the kind of nuances of contemporary architecture, I think. And I, I, something I really like about it. But at that night, she talked quite a bit about Paul, Mac, uh, Paul, Mac, <coughs> Paul McCarthy and, and Coons and, and this kind of span of late, late, late pop possibilities in art and how architecture is or isn't coming to terms with them, which to me suggests, you know, in terms of the question of, of fat, a much more, uh, you know, much more sophisticated stance towards, towards pop than either Venturi's or what came after, or what, you know, what operates in that lineage. But this is my question to you, Jeff, and this actually has to do with the, with the event. Because in, in contemporary art now, a lot of the, it seems as though a lot of the argument in contemporary art is between two notions of event, one of which would follow, follow in the wake of Paul McCarthy and, and, and Mike Kelly and, and a kind of CalArts culture of the abject and possibilities that have, to me, a kind of, well, I think, a, almost a kind of very tail end of expressionism driving some of their, some of their possibilities. And then relational aesthetics, which has become a much more, a much more, uh, um, much more popular, but I think a much more curated notion of the event, a much safer notion of it. But as you were talking about the about affect as a as a kind of the way you characterize Florencia's uh, the kind of the kind of. Uh, that pixelated sense of, of, of affect after the fact. Right. Would that be fair? Yeah. That seems to me to operate actually between those two, between those two questions in fine art in a pretty interesting way. It, but I'm interested. Do you feel like you're comfortable? Do you think of your work as dead center in architecture or operating between the two? I, I, <clears throat> I think it's, um, it works within architecture, uh, but it's it's definitely influenced by fine art. Yes, and I, I you know, I, I not only uh, I mean, you mentioned Kunz or Murakami or you know uh, McCarthy. I think it, it, it pop pop comes through not through architecture but through art. The interest in pop, maybe other examples of our, of architecture that has investigated that mainly also your influence to a lot of uh, many of the architects through Greg. I feel like apologizing. Through, to just, no, but it's, it's sorry true. For that. Sorry. I mean, you're like the, the standard for Kunz. But, it, but it, in a way, I think it's the, the idea that, that you look at culture at large uh, relates through art. I think, it, I mean, it goes back to some elements. Uh, and I always show the, you know, the basis of um, Venturi Scott Brown on how they figure out how to look at culture and look at architecture. And then with a few filters that are a little bit strange, you know, like collapse them, two of them. And so that's, uh, that's uh, and so this tries to revisit that, but definitely art, it doesn't try to become art for sure, but it, it definitely 
looks at that. And you? Whether Florence's work is... Well, I'm just uh, curious, do you think... Relation? Are you attached to... Uh, how do you feel about the possibility that work can negotiate between those... Like, it can, can something be... I think absolutely. I mean, it's, uh, you know, can with my own something work, negotiate it's constantly between been a cat and a dog? Can you be kind of a cat and kind of a dog? Can you be it's kind a of a god? Walking the gods. <laughs> <laughs> I don't feel this way. It just seems like there are more cats and dogs that like each other than there used to be. Or there, there's well, that's true. An easier, an easier, I, that's because of YouTube. Reward. That's just well, actually, the distortions of YouTube. Well, I would, I would <laughs> stop you at you. I think, Jeff, I think it's because of you and a number of other architectural critics who actually were, were versed enough in contemporary art to make, to make that discussion really intrinsic to our own. But I wonder, you know, would it be fair to say that you still prefer painting to most, to most other media and media and contemporary art? Yes. If that's the case, I actually do think the representation and abstraction question, to the degree that it lingers in our field far longer and more kind of more powerfully than it ought to, I actually do think some of that's at your doorstep. Then, well, because I don't, I don't, uh, I don't accept taking. No, I don't deny the. You know, you're right. You're absolutely right. Uh, in fact, Marcelin, I've been working on this. Uh, it's a piece of weird piece of history, but. Uh, Wolf, you know, whether architecture is real or not is an interesting question to me. You know, whether we can speak of it as having any reality or a project of reality, or whether it has, like an art form, a realism. You know, and so painting, we can speak of realist painting or non-realist painting, and I think that actually is true of architecture. There is realist, all, lots of architecture, most architecture is realist, but none of it is real. It constructs a realism, but is never measured by the degree to which it is quotidian and abject, and it's, that's what a building is. A building is real. Architecture is everything about a building that's either realist or not realist, it's sort of in, in the most simplest terms. So I, don't, I do think of architecture as in the ecology of art. But I also think species in an ecology are species, just like cats and dogs. They don't really, there are no monsters, there are no crossovers. And that they, the way they maintain their integrity is not through decision or deciding, I'm going to be an architect. I, you know, they do that because they have strong characteristic differences. For example, in natures like duration, threshold, you, you, you know you know when you're in the beginning of a painting and you know where you're at the end of a painting, you don't know where, you know, there are ways that architecture and painting and music and theater and all the various art forms uh, work in an ecology so we know exactly what species they are and the performances of the effects that they produce are indistinguishable, I mean, are always distinguishable from one another in those terms. And so um, that's why there's never any confusion for me. It, that's why I felt permission to introduce a discussion of, so I believe in the autonomy of every discipline, just like Eisenman did, but I don't believe in the autonomy as he felt like it was an isolated practice. I believe in the autonomy of the disciplines in the same sense as I believe in the autonomy of every species in an ecology. And that there's an economy that connects every species, but they maintain their economy, eco autonomy. Every species in an ecology, there are no monstrous interspecial types. So I understand, and by the way, I don't think this is just a bi borrowed biological metaphor. I think it's a fundamental property of matter theory. You know, so I, but I, I cling to this. I mean, this is implicit in Deleuzian thinking in all of the way I have been formed as a thinker. Um, and I know it's vulnerable, and it's very easy to imagine how it would be, but it serves me very well, and it serves me, it makes me able to do stuff like distinguish between a painting and an architecture, even though I can negotiate on arguments between 
both. But it also helps me do stuff like catch Wolflin making mistakes <laughs> when he tries to move from one to another. So, um, so Jeff, it sounds like a little bit of what you're doing is assigning autonomy to uh, certain disciplines, but allowing language to mediate between so that that discourse can kind of operate in that space between art and architecture. It actually is necessary for discourse to operate in that space between the two disciplines in order to adjudicate membership in the way that you're doing. Well, I do think, yes, I think you're right, of course. I mean, there is going to be cash or food. Uh, the, the, the cash of biological economies is food which is why I came up with my great formula that the point of all reproduction is not the, not the continuation of a species, but the production of food. Almost all sexual production is eaten. And that's how one species communicates with another. <laughs> Sorry about this. So, um, and there's cash or there's money that, that keeps all members, all the species in an economy in contact with one another. So you're right, so language does do that. But for example, you can, there are certain things you can always pay attention to. For example, when something is a metaphor in another species of practice, but not in, when, for, when fashion is not a metaphor in the fashion industry, but a, a metaphor in another industry and it's pejorative in every other industry but the fashion industry, you should pay attention to that. You know, or, so there are ways to understand how language operates when something goes from being an actual condition in one discipline to a metaphorical condition in another discipline. Painterly is a perfect example. Painterly is a metaphor in every other discipline except painting. And so I know you can talk about painterly paintings, but you know exactly what you're talking about, where you never know what you're talking about when it's a metaphor in every other discipline, or poetic, or, so I do think so, the problem- So in fact, it works in painting and no And by else. the way, I stayed last night at the Figueroa Hotel. I don't know how this turned into a discussion about me, but I stayed at the place called the Figueroa Hotel last night. It's an incredibly interesting place. Weird place to work, because it has no plugs. <coughs> I wake up this morning, there's three books on the shelf the collected works of Chaucer. <laughs> anyway, so, but the, the reason all this discussion is coming, we gotta, we gotta stop in a second, but it's because Florencia's work, and this, I think this is true for someone like uh, Liz Diller and Rick Scafidio. Liz Diller and Rick Scafidio's Scofidio, work was condemned over and over again, both by both the architecture world and the art world for simply being late borrowing of conceptual art as architecture. And I don't know of, an, of any criticism more trivial and more not to the point. You know, if, you, if that were true, uh, it would be contentless. It, it, would have, it would have no, but if you cannot understand what that means, if, if there's no such thing as a movement, it's not even a borrowing. All of their work is always situated with the kind of intensity and its expectation of effects in precisely architectural terms. Never for the duration of effects, never in the situation specific, in the situation of specificity of, architect, of an artwork, even when it was in a gallery. And, that, and the same thing I think is true for Florencia. So there's never been any confusion, I don't think. Now, I do know that there are artists and architects that do practice in both. That's also perfectly, uh, that's perfectly legitimate, but I can always can tell the work. Generally, it's not very good. You know, uh, I don't know very many good artists that are also good architects and vice versa. But it happens occasionally, I mean, there's, you know, so. Let me ask one more question. Yeah, sure. Uh, no, but let, let a quiet person ask first. <laughs> Who's going first? Ben. <laughs> I'll, I'll go. Um, Who are you? Yo, you're the PhD guy. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm Ben. <laughs> you cannot tell. I'm, I, I got to tell you how much the I hate. The only thing I hate worse than people after their PhDs 
is people during them. <laughs> I hate PhDs. They are like the pubescence of intellectuals. They fan it. Yeah, go ahead. So I'll try to say something. You will. About pubescent. <laughs> um, but um, I'm interested in this idea of um, architecture that lingers. And I'm, I'm kind of thinking about that, and I'm wondering about that relative to this idea of realism. It, it seems to there be a production of a kind of a realism in a work where it's not the thing isn't there anymore, but it's lingering, so it's still affecting you in a, in a kind of a precise way, but, but something that's not direct. And something also that interests me in kind of a parallel idea to lingering is something that nudges. So I'm interested in things that nudge something outside of maybe a familial, familiar cultural register, let's say. And I met this artist last year who did um, an installation for the 2008 Olympics in London. And he, he, did, a, he did a series of, of oversized doorknobs on a bunch of buildings that I thought was pretty wonderful. And to me, that was something that would like linger afterward. You'd have this new relationship to, the, to a trope or a, a convention of architecture or a convention of space. And I'm curious what um, um, Jeff or Florencio or, or Marcelin, what the lingering effect might be in this work. And is it, is it the color? Is it the contour? Is it the... Is you mean it in the, this work or yeah, that work? Yeah, yeah. Um, and so, you know, I'd, I'd be curious to know what you talk, how you talk about what lingers. For me, each work has a typological specificity that determines the duration of its lingering. Like PS1 is an installation, and it can and it can be faster. You know, and so I don't know. Andrew and I were talking about like my a show, a gallery show, can no, knows it can work with more intensity and faster, just like that doorknob. But for example, do you know Moss's, uh, you know, Moss, the practice Moss? Do you, I don't know if you know, they did a seaside house. It's, all the doorknobs in that house, it's, it's a handle like this. What the fuck? Just because you found it doesn't mean you're the only one entitled to use it. <laughs> Not only did he find it, find it, he explained it to me. So what? You know? Anyway. Thank you, Todd. Now, now, I, wanna, now this, I wanna watch you screw it up. Now, he sends me this picture, he says, what's interesting about this thing? I, I couldn't figure it out. All the door handles are facing down. Okay. I didn't get it. I mean, I stared at that thing forever and ever. I sent it to everybody. Uh, the point being, obviously, they look broken, you know, or weird to handle. You know, so big would, would be too fast for an architectural work, perfect for an artwork or perfect for, even an art installation where it could negotiate that way. But for a house that you lived in for a long time over and over and over again, facing down is perfect. And facing down in a photograph is perfect for an architectural work. You know, so I think those are the kinds of negotiations I'm, I'm totally interested in. And I think you're gonna find it in all the work. Like each, each one is more or less calibrated to its circumstance. That's what I think. What do you think? For me, the lingering, I mean, PS1 is a good example. The balloon frame, this sort of strangeness of taking the balloon frame framing system as a trope in a sense and saying, okay, the, the title of that is balloon frame. It's also literally taking profiles from parade balloons. So a completely different referent yeah. and kind of crossing these over and forming this amalgam out of that in a way that, again, you know, that would be another instance of what I would call the caricature, like exaggerated features, um, the act of naming, how those two then really produce objects that you actually have to take a certain duration to uh, understand, in a sense. I mean, they really draw you in. And I think that that is, uh, for me, that would be that lingering I mean, quality. I Good teach example. that the single worst effect an architect can produce, or flirt with is getting it. Is what? Get is getting it. You know, like oh, balloon getting. frame, balloons, and a frame is flirting with getting it, but it's appropriate because it's at a, you know, three month exhibition and you need to get it. Mm -hmm. But if you get it in a house or you get it in a building or you do anything that you get, 
Have you ever had someone tell you a joke 10 times that you get? The first time you like, the 10th the time you're not friends anymore, and the 11th time you've just committed murder. Like, getting it is why Stanley Tigerman is not going to go down in history. I mean, you, you, you just have to be really careful. careful. But would the doorknob be an example? Of yeah, getting it? doorknob. The moss is doorknob? Getting no, no, the, the moss doorknob. The moss being the moss doorknob, I just think, That's is perfect. Like you would never get it, even if you got it. You know, I mean, it would never produce that kind of, you know, that thing. You just, you, it would be but always I quiet. You, I don't think the balloon frame would either, unless you read the whole story and knew that. I think for an architect, it would immediately. Mm -hmm. I mean, because of the title. But the duration is definitely an issue. On yeah, the, the but I mean, for example, yeah. hey, what are you doing here? Congratulations. Thanks. Where's your wife? Uh, somewhere else. Tell her I'm going to get her homework one day. Don't worry about it. I'm on 2011 of returning test exams and homeworks. And <laughs> don't worry, it happens. And I'm on about 2011 on answering emails. So you'll get it if you're sending these. But things. Jeff, do you think the distance is the issue of not getting it, or not? Distance is there's no yeah. Not distance is no you know it doesn't matter. I mean, that's the thing I think is really important. That's what I really I went from really not liking Bernard's buildings because they're so inert to liking them after thinking through this problem. I mean, I, I just thought they were really bad buildings. The recent, or? Yeah, I mean, all of his buildings are exact instantiations of the ideas in a certain way. I mean, they're really materializations of the diagrams. So the diagrams are not interesting. I mean, it's, I don't know, you'll have to read it. I, I'm not really sure. It's very much like a good theorist oftentimes has a good idea for bad work and then the academia, I don't know, you know, but I do. It, it starts with this. You go see a, a good James Bond film starring Sean Connery. And then you, you leave the movie and for about two hours, your window washers or machine gun, your knobs can shoot windows and you can pull over close to the car next to you and flatten their tires. You know, for two hours, you're living out the reality of that movie in your car, and it keeps, you know, it lasts a while, and it's always there a little bit, you know, so that's a hot version of affective sense memory. And you realize that your whole life is, and you know, Freud teaches us that if I'm talking to a student, they, I can make them feel, if they're 20 years old, I can decide. I can make them feel 19, 18, 20, it depends. I can use a tone of voice, make them feel any age I want, they don't know it. You know, so I can use those techniques. If I ask you a question, I make you feel desire to answer the question in the terms that I ask you, and you don't even know I'm doing these things to you. So we have all sorts of affective controls at that level, and that every medium, and every you know, magicians use these things all the time you know, forces in this direction. And so architecture is already working like that. Staircases and that. So to understand that, that, that we've already been working on those as it is and that we could operate at that level and build our event and affect theory based on our history of effects was, is what this is about. But I, I in, in 97, the last year I was graduating from, uh, from undergrad, um, I, I found this text in a croquis magazine called The Cunnings of Cosmetics. Yeah, I read that. <laughs> By Chef Kim. I literally memorized that text. Memorize it. I, you know. Memorize it. Remember, 1997 and the, the, the was a distance, long damn time The distance ago. starts, it starts there, I think. 27 the years ago. realization, you hated them, and then you liked them, and then you hated them. But it's like, it's a, the distance of understanding there's something other. I'm done. Any more? Yeah. Any real people got questions? <laughs> like, really, people that haven't read all this crap and don't care about any of this stuff? You. You. Yeah, you. Yeah, the one that's looking around. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Make it up. Do me a, just do me a favor. Like, ask this. Are you guys done yet? Are you a student here? Yeah. What year are you in? Who are you studying with? <laughs> <laughs> He's from UIC too. You're from UIC? Is this, okay, 
Do you know anything about the debate between the difficult and the, the difficult and the easy? Jesus. <laughs> Does anybody here know anything about the debate between the difficult and the easy? Shape and form. Bob and. See, that would have been a way to just. Talk. I mean, this is something you guys should understand. I mean, eight years ago or seven years ago, this was a debate started between Bob Sommel and Greg Lynn, maybe eight years ago, nine years yeah. ago. Uh, The good, the bad, the beautiful. Oh. I don't know, whatever. Forget it. But anyway, <laughs> they used to be really good friends. But anyway, Bob Somel decided he wanted his own following in the world. <laughs> and Greg had too big a following. So, uh, and Bob was right. Bob said all that Maya stuff, all of that difficult geometry stuff had become institutionalized. He used exactly the same form of argument I had used to get rid of collage. It had become an institutionalized form that was self-reproducing and that every time you saw one of these mushed up, chewed up pieces of chewing gum that Maya produced, all you were seeing was something that was justified because it, all it produced was a sense of how difficult the process was to produce it. And it produced a sense of its own difficulty and therefore had no other justification in the world except that. And then he made an argument about the easy and that the easy was a project, had its own project and produced lifestyles. And he introduced, in a certain sense, I think that's the moment Jeff Koons became interesting to architects because Jeff Koons had just written his first book of his collected work called The Easy. And we all became aware of that. And so the, Greg answered that discussion with the toy tables in which he made difficult geometries easy. And they was, that was a fantastically rich, wonderfully worked out debate. Never got worked out in writing and discourse. Got entirely worked out in design by architects. Um, and it's no longer a, a problem. I mean, it, it's worked out, it's solved. You can do both easy and difficult in difficult geometries and easy geometries, and if you want a difficult if you want a difficult affect, you can produce a difficult affect. And if you want an easy affect, you can use simple geometries or difficult geometries. And the problem of blob versus boxes or simple geometries, all of that is just gone. Because that problem arose, got worked out, and never actually got worked out in anybody writing any papers, except for the, is that right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Well, 10 reasons to get into shape. Yeah, and, I mean, uh, a couple of papers got written, and there have been people that write it, but it's, it's fantastic. How these a few issues, a few discussions happen, some smart people think about it, and they get really worked out, and all of this work is inscribed in it completely. In fact, everything we've shown today, the, the four projects that I showed in the early, everything that goes on at this school is totally inscribed and circumscribed by that debate and made and underwritten by it. You know, and, and in a certain sense, it's comfort with that now needs to be thought about a little bit, I think. Um, so when you say you're from UIC and you've come here, at a certain point, that wouldn't have been possible. I mean, you know, we, it was, we've been enemies. And uh, Jimenez, where is Jimenez? Jimenez is, teaches at UIC and has come here, come to, U, to UCLA and is hanging around here. I hope he's come to see me and married a woman at Princeton, a student of mine at Princeton, who I haven't finished grading her final paper yet. Yeah. The whole world kind of sucks, actually. I mean, but you get the idea, right? There's conversation. Jimenez is, y'all know his drawings in architecture. I mean, all of this is, gets connected in an incredibly interested, fast way. So Jimenez's work is directly related, I think, to Florencia's work, not through the cartoon, the appropriated cartoon, but through drawing cartoons, and this becomes a new form of discourse. And now I just got through reading Sean Lally's book. I don't know if you know Sean Lally's book, and, and uh, Liam Young, and I'm starting to discover a whole new way of people are writing theory, which is a matter of mixing sort of 
reading serious issues, whether it's history or science or technology, mixing that with personal fictions and future fictions. It's a kind of theory that's t it's a very personal, totally not annoying by preaching to you, uh, wonderfully compelling in the fact that it contains real ideas. So for the first time in, I don't know, maybe 20 years, first time since novel technotic, tectonics, I'm starting to read a new kind of theory writing that I'm trying to copy uh, that doesn't sound like Todd, you know, that I'm going to try to get Todd and Marcelin to, you know, Marcelin already writes well, but you know, it doesn't <laughs> sound like PhD guys, um, you know, that really has a way of speaking about the work that's going on now. That's what we're always looking for, ways to speak about the work that goes, speaks to it, to its sensibility, to its spirit. And you know, all of a sudden I'm incredibly optimistic. Well, there's got a whole bunch of people that can say what's going on and you feel really good about it. And I think that's a great note to close on and go eat lunch. <laughs> so thanks. Thanks.